So it is my great pleasure to introduce Hibba Krisht. Um, she's been a speaker at the Secular Student Alliance Conference before, and we're delighted to have her back. She's a writer and a professional translator from Beirut. Um, she's had stories published in the Kenyan Review and Blackbird and many other publications in addition to that. Uh, and she was the recipient of the 2012 Jane Fulkes Manlo Fellowship or, uh, from Indiana University uh, and the 2013 Joanne uh, Athanas Memorial Award in Literature from the National Society of Arts and Letters. And she has an incredibly, I don't know, just a story that every time I realize, like, oh yeah, that's just Hibba, like, yeah, she grew up in Hezbollah, NBD. Like, it just, I'm totally floored and I can't tell you how incredibly proud and excited I am that she is part of our cool, nifty, intersectional secularism. Please join me in welcoming her. Hello. Um, here is the mic. All right. So the unfortunate thing about this talk is that I could talk about this for hours and hours and hours, and I only have half an hour. Um, so I'm going to try to break things down um, as much as I can, and then like I'm going to be around all weekend if you all want to, you know, talk about things, questions, etc. Um, so I'm so um, my talk is called um, "Veils Virginity" and in parentheses in uh, invisibility on growing up as a woman in Hezbollah culture. Um, and uh, I guess before I kind of start, a quick note as to why I think it's important to give this talk in particular. Um, I, I feel like there, there's a radical disconnect between um, how people outside of insular mainstream Muslim communities view those communities and then what goes on uh, within. Um, and I feel like part of that problem is that there are lots of dynamics of um, control suppression and invisibility that are, by their very nature, um, basically um, not uh, uh, perceptible to the outsider. Um, and it, I feel like there is a dire moral need to highlight what's going on there because there is so much lack of information and so many misconceptions about what's going on. So um, Hezbollah culture, uh, as I call it, is, is I, I, I would say, one of the more um, insular um, conservative Muslim communities in the world. Um, and I call it a Muslim community because um, th this is, again, what I'm talking about when I'm, ta when I'm talking about kind of like, you know, misconceptions about what things actually are and how the dynamics are and how complex everything is. So what is Hezbollah? Um, so there's a strong sense uh, that I get that, at least in the West, uh, when people think about a militant uh, Islamist organization such as Hezbollah, um, they have, uh, I, I guess, they don't have a very good idea about um, basically exactly what it is and how it works. Um, so I feel like with uh, Hezbollah in general, there is the conception that it is a um, basically a militant Islamist group, and it does this kind of like um, guerrilla warfare and suicide operations and stuff like that, and that's basically the extent of it. Um, Hezbollah is an organization that was founded in 1982. Um, it has grown and expanded. Uh, to such an extent that right now I think you could credibly say that there are three branches to Hezbollah. Uh, one, it is a political party. Um, Hezbollah has members in parliament, in the cabinet of ministers, um, in uh, you know, municipal elections, and there are very many areas of, of Lebanon in general uh, where Hezbollah has almost complete monopoly and control. Um, the second part, uh, would be uh, social infrastructure, um, social institutions. So Hezbollah is also very, very extensively a social institution in Lebanon in the sense that they have uh, hospitals, orphanages, um, uh, funds for uh, distributing charity, um, what's called martyr, the martyr foundation, uh, martyr funds, just all sorts of um, social services, it, including providing access to basic utilities if and when the Lebanese government fails to do so. Um, 
And this has generally been very much a problem in Lebanon because we, we you know, there have been, I don't know if you know this, but there have been like daily power cuts in Lebanon since the 1970s all across the, the country because of um, just war and that kind of stuff. So kind of like outlining that there, uh, okay, and the third part would be the, you know, the, the militant organization, the actual um, group that does the fighting. And these are like the three separate parts of Hezbollah. Now, there is kind of like a reason why Hezbollah is so extensively structured in this way in, in a country such as Lebanon. So here I'm going to just give a little bit of political background. So Lebanon is a tiny country on the coast of the Mediterranean, around the um, size of Rhode Island. It is bordered by the sea on the west, and then Syria on the north and the east, and then Israel on the south. Um, in 1975, the Lebanese Civil War broke out. Uh, the Lebanese Civil War was a sectarian civil war, um, and so it was basically the Sunnis, the Shia, and uh, various Christian factions basically fighting each other for political control, uh, you know, in this um, sliver of, of a country. Um, and the civil war was, it was very, very brutal, very, very bloody, um, and the only way that basically we were able to solve it, and, and, and I say this in like air quotes because it is, it is really tragic, the, the kind of like irony and how we were able to solve the civil war is basically by cementing the same bigotries that caused it to begin with. So um, the civil war was resolved in 1990 through a treaty called the Ta'if Accord, in which basically the way that the Lebanese stopped fighting over the basically how to divide the pie was by dividing the pie according to sect. So the Lebanese government um, is basically a sectarian confessional system such that um, um, it, it basically representation uh, operates in reflection of demographics. So uh, and, and um, according to the last census that was taken, um, our government structure is such that the president must be a Maronite Christian, the uh, Speaker of Parliament must be a Shia Muslim, and the Prime Minister must be a Sunni Muslim. Um, in terms of who you can vote for, who your representatives can be um, on the parliamentary and the municipal levels, same thing. It kind of breaks down according to sect. Um, your sect is on your ID much the same way that your um, name and place of birth and your gender are, um, and it is virtually impossible to change your sect. Um, and, and sect uh, being on, and, and so like, and, and again, a sect is, is a function of birth. It's a function of the, the community you were born into and, and the part of the country that you're from, and it doesn't really have much to do with what your actual beliefs are. So my Lebanese ID says Shia on it, and it's going to say Shia on it until I die. Um, and there, there's no secular, uh, option. There's no like secular alternative, um, and and the way that kind of like the Lebanese people resolved their conflicts in terms of like how are we going to dictate like civil laws because everyone has different conceptions about what is fair and what is just and what is allowable, and so even to the uh, even to the extent of like um, we have something called personal status laws, such that the sect of your birth literally dictates what types of rights and privileges you have when it comes to a few things, such as um, uh, marriage, inheritance, divorce, that kind of thing. So to give you a couple of concrete examples, if you were a Shia woman, like me, or a Muslim woman in general, you are only allowed to legally marry in Lebanon um, someone of the opposite gender who is also a Muslim. A Muslim woman cannot marry a non-Muslim man. Um, on the other hand, a Muslim man can marry a Christian or a Jewish woman, because that's the way that the doctrine is set up. Um, and then if you look at like the Christian side, this is where it gets funny because you know they have to intersect. Um, it, it, because of the kind of like the restrictions of the faith, there aren't any restrictions uh, preventing a Christian woman from marrying um, a Muslim man or a, a Christian man from marrying a Muslim woman, yet it's still illegal for a Christian man to marry a Muslim woman because a Muslim woman cannot legally marry a Christian man. Um, and so, and so, and, and, and there are different, um, and you know, each religion has different rules in terms of like how inheritance works and how divorce works and how to, sell. and so it's basically the core of your own religion is where you deal with this stuff. Um, and, and I'm pointing this out to kind of um, give an idea of how, uh, how divided it really is in terms of like, um, so, so I like to make this analogy that um, sectarianism in the Levant 
in the Middle East in general is much like racism is in the US. It is a very, very um, a divisive and pervasive force that basically um, feeds into the most basic of um, aspects of, of livelihood and, and social institutions and so on. Um, like to the extent, I mean, there, there are lots of like parallels. So, so one, um, class lines tend to be pretty rigid across sectarian boundaries. Um, in terms of just geography, Lebanon is a very, very provincial place. So everybody knows that the majority of South Lebanon is Shia, the majority of North Lebanon is Sunni, and then the majority of the mountains are like um, split between the, the Druze, which is a, um, a minority group, and then different um, Christian and Sunni groups. And then like, if you look at like metropolitan Beirut and its, um, a, and its suburbs in general, people know which area of the city is Sunni, which area is Christian, which area is Shia. And um, things are such that each sect basically has like retreated into their own domains of control. Um, and they can basically, uh, I mean, they can't do whatever they want, but there is only so far that the law goes um, in terms of like what a certain religious demographic wants to do within its own sect. So for instance, if a Christian family wants to open like a mini mart in a Muslim neighborhood that sells alcohol or sells pork, even though it is legal to sell both alcohol and pork if you have the requisite licenses, et cetera, in Lebanon, that's not going to happen. The, the place will be run out of business or forcibly closed down within the week. Um, and so people, so people really um, maintain super, super rigid control over, um, over their demographics. So I'm, I'm kind of like providing this, um, uh, this background to, uh, to kind of like, uh, to, to kind of like cement the fact of how pervasive and insidious the type of control a single sect can have over their um, community. So I want to talk about Hezbollah Lebanon, and I want to talk about Shia Lebanon, and I want to talk about Shia Lebanon, Hezbollah Lebanon, as almost basically synonymous. Um, so the Shia demographic of Lebanon is not reducible to Hezbollah by any means, but Hezbollah has such extensive and pervasive control over Shia communities and areas um, that it is really, really hard to um, extricate the two. So I mentioned the social institutions thing. Um, I don't know if you all heard about, um, y y do you remember the Paris attacks in, uh, back in November? ISIL hit, uh, so the day before, ISIL hit Beirut. Um, and the neighborhood of Beirut that they hit is in this area called Dahi, uh, which is basically just means suburbs, the suburb. Um, um, and uh, Dahi is well known as a Hezbollah controlled area, a Shia controlled area. They hit this uh, neighborhood called Burj al Burajne. And in many of the kind of like news reports um, in which this was dealt with, people talked about like, you know, a Hezbollah stronghold being. Um, attacked. Now, part of the reason why this is so problematic is that it is literally impossible to differentiate between the Shia community and Hezbollah stronghold. Because any Shia neighborhood you point to in the entirety of Lebanon, there is going to be a Hezbollah school or orphanage or institution or foundation on a corner here or there. And that's basically what's pointed to when people go like Hezbollah stronghold. It is, so, so basically, when it, it is effectively impossible to, to, to extricate an understanding of a Shia community in Lebanon. Again, these are people who were born into it. A sect is binding in this almost the same way that ethnicity is. So that like people can, so, so with me, just hearing the dialect that I speak of, of Lebanese Arabic, like my accent, or knowing my name, or knowing the village my father is from, any one of these three, you don't even need the three of them, it marks me a Shia like this. It marks me like a Shia like this. Um, and, and so it really very much is like, like, ethnicity more than it is faith. I mean, we don't know how many of the people who ended up being killed in the ISIL attacks in Burj al Burajni were actually, you know, religiously Shia, because that's a neighborhood that I've gone to, you know, I've, I've shopped there, I've gone to doctors there. I mean, it, it's a neighborhood. It's a civilian neighborhood. Um, now, in terms of, like, um, the Shia doctrine in particular and the rise of Hezbollah and why people adhere so strongly to it and why it's such, like, a, 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 a strong... Uh, conservative system. So uh, the Civil War, it, it was a very, very, very trying and bloody ordeal. Um, and sectarian, it, it basically it cemented these sectarian tensions that were already at um, like an all-time high. It was never really uh, resolved. At the time, right now, Shia, uh, the Shia of Lebanon are 
uh, I wouldn't say they're a majority, but they're like, kind of like neck and neck with the other um, sects. But at the time, the Shia were, were a minority. They were legitimately the poorest and most disenfranchised minority in the country. Um, and they were the ones that were, um, I, I think, largely the, the most um, decimated in the war. And then Israel invades. Israel invades in 1982. Um, and they and and again the, the so Israel is on Lebanon's southern border. The in, almost the entirety of South Lebanon, from the southern border until Beirut, which is kind of in the middle of the country on the coast, um, is is a Shia area. Um, and then it was like, okay, so now there's this foreign invasion, and there's all this stuff that happened with the civil war, and there are these people who are like, you know, they have nothing and they have no one, and then this huge religious revivalism started. This, the, the hijab that I'm wearing in this photo, this was not normalized in Shia Lebanon and South Lebanon prior to um, uh, the civil war, the Israeli invasion, and then the, the rise of Hezbollah. Um, now, now, these like, political events aren't, um, uh, they are not, uh, you can't consider them to be like, um, isolated. So there were other things happening at the time. There was a huge um, uh, surge of refugees from fleeing the civil war to other parts of the world, um, especially the West. My own mother's family um, uh, fled the civil war in 1978, settled up in Dearborn, Michigan. I don't know if you all have heard of Dearborn, Michigan. It's a pretty insular Muslim community up there. Um, and and then, uh, and then the Iranian Revolution was going on basically around the same time, the 70s and the 80s. Um, and all of this, and all these things all together um, create this kind of like network of, of like revivalism in terms of like Shia sensibilities. So like my mother and her si sisters and her and my grandmother did not wear hijab at the time. Um, and, um, but, th but then, uh, there was this kind of like this huge wave of like, I, I call it the huge wave of, of hijabification. And then after that, not a single girl born into my family in the next generation, and I have a tribe of cousins, let me tell you, was uh, basically did not start wearing it at the age of eight, because that's basically what official Shia doctrine says um, about, uh, about modesty. Um, so, so just a little bit about the Shia doctrine. So Shia Islam is, uh, so um, I'm not sure on the, on the numbers, but it, it's a minority sect of Islam. So we know that the kind of like main, uh, the main schism in Islam was between Sunni Islam and Shia Islam, but the Shia were, have always been the minority. I think right now it's about 15 or 20 percent, something like that. Um, and Shia Islam basically, it, it is very, very important to note that being a minority and, and considering themselves as basically, it was a schism in the sense that, in the sense that they were the ones who were rejecting the people who came into power, who took the caliphate, who were the Muslim authorities. And so there's this, this general kind of like, um, almost essential sensibility about being Shia that has to do with um, being like assaulted from the outside, being, um, and, and, um, and so there's like this seminal um, narrative in Shia Islam, it's called the, basically the Husseini narrative. I don't know if you've heard of this, um, but uh, the Prophet Muhammad, he had uh, his grandson, Imam Hussein, was uh, massacred in the, it's called the Battle of Karbala, massacred with uh, so many members of, of his family and, and his companions, etc., on their way to, um, uh, to heed a call from the people of Kufa because there was, uh, in Iraq, because the, the caliphate, the, the, cal the caliph at the time, um, uh, Yazid bin Muawiyah, was considered to be like this, this unjust, uh, stuff like that. And so, and so there was this like, this seminal battle that everyone, Everyone in the Shia world, um, basically, uh, everyone in the Shia world basically commemorates in, in extreme detail every single year. And so the, the battle itself was 10 days long. And so people commemorate that for 10 days and they mourn for 40 days after. And they basically go blow by blow through everything that happened in the battle. And that is a sensibility that they carry forward into the future. Now, when you have a Shia, um, when you have a Shia community um, of the type in South Lebanon that, is, that has just been ravaged by war um, and that, uh, where there's like no support from anyone else and then you have this like this grassroots group coming up from within the civilian population and it's using this very particular doctrine that, that itself frames itself um, in terms of resistance and um, fighting and, and control and, and stuff like that. It, it, it tends to be super, super helpful. And then, and then if you look at the particular, oh God, I don't have time to go into any of this because there's so much. If you look at the very, very particulars of Shia doctrine, the way it begins to bear in um, is, is just, 
it's astronomically astounding how clever it is. So, for instance, there, there's, there's this um, also kind of like a revivalist narrative of the Mahdi. He's kind of like the, the savior who is to come. Um, and he's, um, Shia Islam has, has 12 figures, 12 imams. They're almost like saint, saints. And the Mahdi is the 12th one. And um, there is, in Iran, in Shia Lebanon, in, in uh, Shia 12-er communities across the world, there is this kind of sensibility that we are in the age of the Mahdi. And the Mahdi is coming back, and he's going to basically champion Islam. Islam, blah, 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 and people actually look at the scriptures, at uh, the scriptures, sorry, and the, the predictions and, and all of the stuff, that, all of the stories relating to the events and the figures in the time of the Mahdi, and the kind of like awareness and, se and sensibility that we are in the time of the Mahdi's coming um, is so strong that like there are like political events and actors that are like right now that are basically kind of like, subsumed into the very interpretation of Shia scripture. So for instance, we have like um, Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah, who is the Secretary General of Hezbollah. Um, there is a, a hadith um, it, uh, surrounding the, the rise of the Mahdi in Shia Islam saying that one of the Mahdi's right hand mans is someone called Al Yamani, um, basically someone of, of Yemeni origin who will be like a, a general and champion him. People think that Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah is, the, is, the, is Al Yamani because you know, he originally came from Yemen, his family, uh, centuries ago. And there's another one about someone called Al Khurasani because the, 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 the lands of Khurasan is basically Persia. Um, and the, in the hadith say that, they, that there's something wrong with his left arm. And what do you know? Imam Khamenei, the, the great leader in Iran, the supreme leader, um, is considered to be the Khurasan, especially because his left, there's some, uh, he has a, a slight disability with his um, left arm. So stuff like that. Like people, are just even within the interpretation of the scripture, the, the political events of the region are, um, are sewn into it. And the, the conception of martyrdom in particular is, is, is exceptionally powerful. It's not, it is quite different than how people view martyrs here uh, or in Christianity. Um, so um, basically if you die in, if you die for any reason um, unjustly and you're a Muslim or if you die basically in um, service of Islam, that makes you a martyr. So basically every civilian killed in an unjust war by an oppressor who is a Muslim is a martyr. Um, and, and also the people who fight, the, the actual uh, boys and men of Hezbollah, who again, they, they're just people from within the Shia population because like Hezbollah literally stands outside of schools and starts talking to these boys when they're 16 or 17 years old and then slowly kind of like convinces them to go down that path. Um, and um, and, and the, there's this really strong um, uh, social utility to the conception of a martyr. For one, it, so as a woman, if you're looking at, at women and how like there's, they're kind of only socially situated in position to men, the, the best thing, the highest status a woman can have in Shia Lebanon is being the mother or the wife of a martyr. Um, and, she, and, and, and when that happens, she's taken care of for life. There's a martyr foundation and they basically, you know, make sure that that's all covered. Um, uh, Ten years ago now, exactly, uh, was the last, uh, the last war with Israel, um, the 2006 July war. Um, and after the war, um, after the war happened, like after the war like was done and everything, um, uh, um, basically, the entire, almost the entire um, infrastructure of South Lebanon was decimated, and then largely that one suburb of Beirut that I was telling you about. And people, give, the, the loss of, of property and, and of life was astronomical. Uh, the Lebanese government was not able or willing to deal with rebuilding, and it was Hezbollah that came in with this huge rebuilding campaign, and it was very well marketed, and the slogan was like, we're going to rebuild it better than it was before. And sure enough, within two or three years, everybody who, uh, everybody who lost a home or property was given, like, you know, if they lost an apartment, their, their building was decimated, another building was raised, and they were given, you know, an apartment in the same. And so, like, when, you know, all, everything within your social structure and then everything within the ideology cements everything that, that protects you and that provides for you, um, and, that, and I, di I didn't really get to go into like how hijab plays into it and, and modesty doctrines and, and all those roles and, and how extensive the, um, 
uh, of the control and the sanitization of the public image and, and, and God, there are, these, there are these rallies where hundreds of thousands of people, and this is in a country with a population of four million Lebanese, about two million Palestinian refugees and one million um, Syrian refugees, hundreds of thousands of people hitting the streets. Um, it, it, you know, in, in regular um, rallies and parades and religious events and so on. Um, and, and where there is so much glory and respect given to people who die in the cause and people who raise, um, raise their children into the cause and so on and so on. So yeah, I, I have to stop here because I am out of time. But yeah, if, I'm, I'm here all weekend. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm tabling for the ex-Muslim North America. Um, you can find me at the XMNA table and I'm also giving a workshop tomorrow. Um, so yeah, questions, comments, all that stuff afterwards.